Gary's going to show us some of his favorite things, and then we're going to talk about his lifelong commitment to music. Take music. it away, Gary. Theme song coming on. <laughs> How are you, dear? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So uh, here we are in the middle of this nice record collection, some incredible stuff. Uh, Can you tell us how you got started with all of that? Um, well, I, I had an older brother who was um, kind of turned me on to, to rock and roll. He listened to, you know, Jerry Lee and, and Elvis and all those guys. So I started pretty young. And... At one point, well, I tell you, I was in the neighborhood and there was a stack of 78s thrown out and I took them home. And one of them, the one right on top was Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, and he had a baby. And I put it on and I went crazy. This is the greatest thing I ever heard. So, I mean, you know, you just kind of, I started loving music and, and every bit of money I had, I would buy records. You know, I had a, it wasn't a big collection of records. I had a stack of records, but you know I'd narrowed it down just to my favorite. You would take records to parties, and you know whatever you would, well, my brother would take them off, and he'd come back with completely different records than he left with, <laughs> which was kind of fun. But um, you'd get some cool ones. But then you'd you'd be what happened to my you know stupid Cupid by Connie Francis? Oh, that sucked anyway. So you, anyway. <laughs> So I had, I had some records, and some friends were over. I still had the amplifier, the, but it's a tube amplifier, and it gets pretty hot. So they were playing the records, and when they were done, they just left them on top of the amp. So I came home, and you know, all, all my, um, a bunch of Sun records, records that I really you know, wanted to have, um, we're all warped. Oh. And I said, oh, no big deal. I'll just go to the record store and I'll buy them, buy them new. So I went to the record store and they had this big book of all this stuff that's, you know, oh yeah, we can order it. And well, this one's out of print. Oh, well, no, you can't get that one. Oh, this one we have. So anyway, long story short, I tried to order all these things. A lot of them were out of print. And the ones that did come in, one of them I remember was Shop Around by the Miracles. And it came, it came, and I got so excited, but it was like on a reissue label, and they added a saxophone. It wasn't the original record. They, there was like a different mix or something. And so that, you know, that's kind of what got me started trying to find the original records. And I realized it's pretty much impossible. So that's kind of how the collecting part of it started, just trying to find the original versions and, and original copies of, of these records that I lost. Cool. Well, isn't Southside, do you and him have something? Have you been collecting together for years? Well, we have. We, well, basically, that's kind of what kept us um, somewhat sane, as sane as we are anyway. Uh, on the road, we'd have a lot of time off in, yeah. in different cities, and we would go to... I would go to the jukebox distributors. I'd go to um, junk stores, old record stores, and you know, find whatever, you know, whatever they had. Usually, in, in the in the back that they hadn't sold, and that's what we would do. A lot of times, it was just stuff you didn't know what it was, so you'd play it in Southside, and I would sit around, you know, playing Smash or Trash. You know, you put it on. And sometimes we'd give it like half of a second if you heard a violin or a girl's voice. <laughs> It would be thrown away. <laughs> and, but, you know, uh, let's, that's not bad. Let's see if there's a good solo in it. I mean, uh, and find reasons to either keep it or not keep it. Yeah. So and that was just, we spent hours doing that. Cool, cool. Do you want to take a look at a few of these things? Sure. Uh, this is one of the records that that got warped. This is obviously not the warped version. This is the one that I actually um, found eventually. But this is a Red Hot by Billy Lee Wiley and the Little Green Men, which was like, it wasn't a hit. So anyway, this is, this is the one that got warped. So I finally went up to New York City 
And they said, oh yeah, they got all those old records up there. I went to the House of Oldies. What year was that? Oh, this is 1968 okay. or so. So the record was only eight years, or ten years old, I guess. But uh, it wasn't a hit, so it wasn't like you know, anything that you could really find. So I get to the House of Oldies, and the guy says, oh yeah, Billy Lee Riley and the Old Green Man. I said, you know the record? He goes, oh yeah, I got it. He pulls it out, and it's, you know, pretty much mint condition. And I go, great, I'll take it. You know, figured 98 cents, right? He goes, yeah, that would be $20. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I brought in some uh, albums that I had. I had Blue Jean Bop by um, Gene Vincent, which is actually a very rare record. And I brought it in, and I said, maybe I could trade this for it. And he goes, yeah, sure, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me the, you know, the, he, I didn't make such a great deal. Yeah, that. yeah. That's kind of what, what began the whole uh, process. Right. Gary, you and I have worked a bunch in the studio, and I, re I remember, I recall one in particular where we were working on a Randy Scruggs album, and the guest artist was Joan Osborne, and it was going to be a duet with Johnny Cash. Right, and he wasn't there. No, he wasn't there. No. Sometimes the, uh, we have to do that, right? Well, it, it's funny because a lot of people, you know, will, will see, you know, your, the credits or something, and, and a lot of people have asked me about Oh, you met this person, that person, and I had to say, no, I, I never met them. I, you know, we just do the tracks, and they come in and do it, do it later. And no, I've never had the pleasure of meeting Johnny. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, me either. I mean, but you played on more of his stuff than I'm. That's the only thing I think, and I'm not even sure that that's the particular session I was even on. But I did notice you have some classical Cliff Rick, Cliff Richards singles over there, and I did an entire album with him. Oh, you did. He wasn't there. Oh, really? Same thing, yeah. yeah so okay. I never met him, but I mean, uh -huh. I got interviewed about it and everything. And I, uh -huh. I said, look, you don't understand. <laughs> but anyway, it happens a lot. Has it happened to you with other artists? It's happened, uh, well, the, one of the first sessions I did in this town was uh, Emmy Lou Harris, which was um, very exciting to me. I, um, Emmy Lou Harris record. Well, it was, um, it was just me and the, Richard Bennett in the, in the studio. And I guess I was, they had already done it, and I was replacing mm -hmm. And it's like... You're not going to name who you're replacing. No, no. I, well, it turns <laughs> out that that's something you, you're not supposed to do. Right, exactly. But I, I didn't know. I was new in town, and I was excited. But she wasn't there. Right? Yeah. I'm I so excited. I mean, look at Sorry. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It happens all the time. While you were asking about the autographs before, I, I, I have a bunch of them. I never really intended to collect autographs, but early on, um, well, I, I played with Chuck Berry, and I didn't have the nerve to ask him for an autograph, so I got Southside Johnny's wife, Betty, to do it for me, <laughs> and she did. And um, so it kind of, I think it began with that, or... What was uh, it like doing with Chuck? That's another story. Uh, it's a, Chuck is a, Chuck is a madman. Um, we uh, we actually were the opening act on the bill for um, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry. We mean uh, before we had a band a name. Uh, it was Bruce Springsteen mm. without you know and his band. So this is probably seventy three or something like that. And somehow we got the gig in um, in Maryland, University of Maryland, I guess. And so we were the opening act, and we knew that Chuck Berry didn't have his own band, and so they had to hire a band to back him up. So we volunteered to be his backup band. So we opened the show, Jerry Lee Lewis came on, and then 
you know, Chuck Berry shows up five minutes before showtime, as he always did. I heard. All by himself with a guitar and in his hand. And, and you know, we're backstage and, and nervous as hell. And so uh, I said to him, uh, Mr. Berry, sir, um, what do you think we'll be playing? <laughs> <laughs> And he says, oh, I thought we might do some Chuck Berry songs. <laughs> but I, I had heard rumors that he did like Ramblin' Rose and did all these kind of crazy things yeah. out of nowhere. And, and I, we wanted to, we really respected him and wanted to do a good job. And, and I've seen him play with bands that had no idea what they were doing. And so we really wanted to do justice to him. Yeah. But, but anyway, we did. No rehearsal. And he just, his instruction was, if my foot goes like this, you stop. If my foot goes like that, you go. Wow. That was pretty much it. Yeah. So. No keys or anything. Oh, no, no. No keys. And um, so he just started, you know, da-da-da-da. And, you know, wouldn't tell you. And he plays in odd keys. And and luckily, I knew that. He plays in piano keys, doesn't he? In like B-flat and E-flat. Yeah. and everybody's trying to figure out the key, and I'd usually be the first one, because you don't even think of B flat, you know, you'd go for A if it's sounded like, and so I would, I would usually be the first one to, and I'd give the, you know, the key to everybody. That was, um, you know, Bruce told that story in the movie. But that's, you know, only because we're not used to playing in, in those, those horn keys or, or piano keys. But anyway, there was, no, there was no instruction at all other than that. He realized that we were really working hard, and you know, he kind of goes, you know, this is okay, you know. <laughs> and Southside Johnny was there, and he's like hiding behind. He's playing a harmonica, and and um, so Chuck's playing, and he and you can hear him go like, you see him go like this, and he hears the harmonica. So and John's trying his best to hide in the back, and. <laughs> And Chuck grabs the microphone stand, and John's like, oh no, he's going to kill me now. And he takes the microphone stand up to the front and says, play, you know, go. Yeah, and yeah. Chuck actually started having a good time. And, he, and at one point, he turned around to, to the band, and we're playing. He goes, play for that money. Get that money, man. Get that money. <laughs> and so anyway, it, it, was, it turned out to be a fairly good show. Uh, that was, but anyway, I, I think that was the first autograph that I had gotten, and um, so I guess in the early days of eBay, I realized that a lot of people didn't know it was really like a garage sale, and I I decided well, I had Clarence Frogman Henry, I you know I had gotten a few people to sign things, and 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 I realized well you know I'll never meet Buddy Holly. You know, I'll never meet Hank Williams. And I wound up with, with a bunch of things. Um, the Buddy Holly thing, I think, was the first one. And Hank, they're hard to find. And, they, they, you know, they're, by now, I guess they're pretty valuable. You know? Carl Perkins, I've got probably five Carl Perkins because I just loved him. And he was just so nice to yeah, always, yeah. you know, Great give an autograph. Um, Cub Coda was... Uh, um, Wrote me a, a nice letter. He loved the the Sonny Burgess album, and, and so anyway, I wind up with well, I got Bo Diddley from I I did a thing at the um, old Lone Star Roadhouse um, with him, and I got him to sign a hip, oh, cool. hip pocket record. <laughs> nice. This is a, is there a record in there? Is there something? Yeah, you used like to a small one? well, you used to play yeah they're on these little portable machines. These. Yeah, yeah, that's I an actual those. record. Yeah. Well, oh, flip, floppy, yeah, sure. Yeah. Fantastic. So he, he said, What the hell is that? <laughs> 1986. And I have a Ray Charles, but I, he didn't sign it. No. <laughs> and somebody else signed it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that, you know, that's the official Ray Charles autograph. Yeah, yeah. The Ernest, Ernest Tubb was cool. I, I found the Ernest Tubb somewhere, I don't know. Um, and that, I actually, I got that from Charlie Leuven. Frank's Domino, is that a real signature? Yeah, I got a couple of, I, that's Frank Sinatra, that was an eBay thing. Um, oh, here's the, here's the first one. 
That's the Chuck Berry that Betty got for me. <laughs> and later on, it's, no, no, it was just a, a bag tag or something, whatever was laying around. And later on, I got the one that says to Gary, um, you know, that when I actually got the nerve to ask him to sign one for me. Um, and there's Clarence Frogman Henry, that's my uh, stay in New Orleans. Junior Wells to Funky T. Mm. Uh, I saw Dale Hawkins in there. Yeah, Dale Hawkins. I, we were in uh, Las Vegas, and I was coming in late, and Tommy Chong is walking in the door. Uh, that's Tommy Chong. And I hold the door for him, you know, and, and I says, you know, can I have your autograph? And he says, thanks, door guy. <laughs> <laughs> really, he had no idea who you were? No. <laughs> Elizabeth Scott was uh, I her. Loving, really loving You. Yeah, and other things. Um, Scotty Moore. All right. Gene Pitney, there's Johnny Cash. And, and Levon. Levon, yeah, actually, that's from his book. The, the, the dog chewed up, but thank God the, the, the first page was saved. Oh, so, the dog chewed the book. Yeah. I, I just got done reading that for the second time. I decided I'd go back and read it after he died. Good book, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. I haven't read it yet. I'd like to. Anyway, that, that's an unintentional collection. Nice. Just nice. one thing leads to another. So, Gary, at, at, at the end of the day, I mean, what do you, what's, what are your thoughts? What do you think makes a great side man? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a great side man. Yes, <laughs> no, um, what makes a great side man? I guess the main thing is um, to be willing to uh, sacrifice a bit of your ego for the star and the music and the song and, and to play for the play for the song. Um, that's it. I, I, I guess I should have pondered that question before, oh, well, but that, the, that, but the fact is, um, it really is about, I mean, I think that all of us kind of are the same age. I mean, when I was eight, I wanted to be Elvis. You know, when I was 15, I wanted to be John Lennon. Um, and then along came Jimi Hendrix. I go, I'm never going to be that. <laughs> so you kind of, your reality kind of changes. And I said, well, you know, it's pretty cool being Noel Redding. Uh, you know, it's being, I, just being in a band was, was cool enough. You know? yeah. and, and I didn't, you know, you don't have the personality that really wants that kind of attention. So uh, I think that's, the, the personality is a big part of it. And then, you know, once you get there, just learning how to, you know, play for the situation. Yeah. Pretty simple, really. Yeah. Congratulations on a great career. Well, <laughs> great to see you again. I'm sorry it's over, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Matt. Hey, today we're visiting with Gary Talent. Oh, I'm sorry. Take three. Take two! <laughs> <laughs>